Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net and it's a time for another cheat sheet review where we'll talk about uh, Windows 10 layout in general, specifically several new layout controls that allow us to achieve Windows 10 layout uh, and that hamburger style navigation. And then finally, we talked about controls as well. So let's open up our cheat sheet and then let's scroll to the bottom here. And we'll start with lesson number 17, where we talked about the relative panel. We said that the relative panel allows you to define an area where all the controls inside can either align themselves relative to the panel itself or relative to the other controls. And we said that the controls would use attach properties uh, to tell the uh, layout engine where they want to be positioned in relation to. And we said that there's different types of properties that can be set. Uh, and they're applied in a certain order. So first you have panel alignment relationships like align the top of my control with the panel, align the left of my control with the panel. And these are applied first. The next grouping are sibling, al sibling alignment relationships. They allow you to align top width relative to another control or left width another control. And then finally applied last are the sibling positional relationships. So uh, for this given control, uh, put it in such a position where it's above or below or to the left or right of a, another given control. All right, so I have a quick little example here that uh, you can use as a form of cheat sheet where we have a relative panel and two rectangles and the first rectangle, it, it sets its attached property align right with panel equals true, so it'll always be to the right of the panel. And then we say uh, to the second rectangle that it will be relative to left of the red rectangle. Okay. All right, next up we talked about the split panel and we said that you use the split panel to create a panel that can be displayed or hidden and it's used for that hamburger style navigation. And we said that uh, it's basically two main pieces of the puzzle there. There is the part that's hidden, that comes and shows itself and hides itself. That's the pane. And then there's the part that is actually beneath it or to the right of it, and that is the content. So let me go ahead and copy and paste a little example into the window here. And uh, it looks like I need a little formatting. And so one of the things that we can do is change the display mode. Uh, and the display mode will dictate the behavior of the pane and uh, the content area, which are defined uh, below it here. And so let me just go ahead and copy and paste in the different display modes. So there's inline, compact inline, overlay, and compact overlay. So inline is where the panel is completely covering the content and when it's shown it'll actually push the content out, uh, push it uh, so that it's still visible. Compact inline is almost identical except it will show a little sliver of, uh, and if you have it docked to the left, of the left hand side so it'll show those icons on the left. Overlay will do the same thing as inline. It'll completely cover the, the, uh, the, the pane will be completely hidden. And when it's shown, it will completely cover the content. Uh, compact overlay will let a little area peek out. And then whenever it's expanded, then it will completely cover what's on, ever underneath it. Okay. And so I also gave a little C sharp code snippet that allows you to basically show and hide the pane. Whatever its current state is, do the opposite and set it equal to the is pane open property. Okay. Next up, we talked about uh, working with navigation. And let's see, let's give you a couple things here. All right, first up, we said that uh, the at the highest level of our application is the app. An app owns a window, and inside the window is a frame. And we see all this set up for us in the app.xaml.cs. Um, and then the frame will load in the main page. Now you don't have to do it that way, but that is what the blank app template will give you. And so then you can either load new pages into that 
that root frame, or you can add other frames into your XAML pages and then load content in and out of that. And we demonstrated that by creating a frame inside of the main page and then loading page one, page two, page three inside of that frame. So the way that you navigate, uh, there's a frame property on the page that will give you access to the parent frame and you just call its navigate method you pass in the type that you want to create a new instance of and you can also optionally pass in any additional parameters of any type then you can retrieve whatever was passed in from the previous page by over overriding a specific method called on navigated to and we can retrieve the value of the parameter that was passed in by calling the navigation event args e dot parameter and then casting it to whatever the object type is that you passed in and then you can work with it in any way that you like we also talked about uh, the back stack and how it essentially keeps the history uh, as you move forward and backwards and it will replay that navigation event and uh, we showed that you can traverse uh, the back stack by checking if the frame can go back or if it can go forward and if it can then you can call go back and go forward methods. And then finally, I demonstrated in that video how you can create kind of a global, video, uh, global variable at the app level by declaring a static internal field in the app class definition. Uh, and that would allow you to get around those situations where um, when you replay the backstack traversing, uh, you don't get the values that you would expect. You don't maintain the state of whatever was typed into a given um, form field. Uh, as you go and you traverse around through the back stack. Okay, next up we talked about uh, common XAML controls, and this is going to be a long one. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because we did work with this at length. So, I basically just stripped out the essence of each of the controls that we looked at and hopefully that'll be helpful to you. So let me go ahead and paste in the first chunk here. All right, so lesson number 20, common XAML controls part one. We looked at the checkbox. Uh, we saw that there was a checked property, uh, although it's not represented here, we we're able to access it programmatically in C Sharp in this line of code. And uh, it also supports a tapped event. We can handle that tapped event and then display you know, some result there. Similar to the checkbox, the yes or no, true or false checkbox is a radio button that allows you to uh, provide several different options to the user. And here you need to use a group name to group together multiple radio buttons that belong in the same group. Uh, so uh, you can see that in this case, I was able to handle the checked event and in that checked event, I implemented this uh, ternary operator where I'm just checking to see if the radio button is checked. If it is, then we'll just print out yes. If it's not, then we'll print out no. You might need to do some variation on that. Also, I didn't mention this at the time, but is checked is a nullable bool. So you have to cast it to Boolean in order to get the ternary operator to work. I should have mentioned that before. It just came to me now. <laughs> All righty. Uh, next up, we talked about the combo box, which allows you to add a number of different combo box items to a list a drop-down list so when somebody clicks the arrow they can see all of the items that were in the list you can set an is selected to a default value uh, so in this case when we load up the XAML page the sixth option will be displayed in the combo box to actually select an item in the combo box we uh, we get the value that's passed in from the selection change event. So there should be in a selection change event args E or and or I'm sorry, there should be a sender and then an event args E. So we're going to take the sender, whoever initiated this um, this event, the selection changed event, we're going to cast that to combo box. Then we're going to find in the combo box a selected item and cast that to a combo box item. And now that we have the combo box item, we can grab its content and then print that to screen. Next up, and this was an important one, the list box. And the list box is important because we were able to use it in the next video where we actually were creating uh, a more full hamburger example. So here we create a number of list box items with content inside of them. We set the selection mode both to multiple and single. When multiple, you can make sure you can select multiple list items. 
and in single you can only select one. And since you can select multiples, I have this little link statement that allows us to find all of the list box items that were selected, grab out just the content and put, it in, put them in an array, and then use string.join for that array and concatenate them all together with a comma. Okay. And then the next thing we talked about was the image control. And you want to set the source attribute and the stretch attribute. We talked about the different stretch options about none, fill, uniform to fill, and stretch. Next up we talked about the toggle button and how to retrieve its value. Um, the toggle button has a is three state. And remember, uh, the three states were clicked, unclicked, and then uh, I guess you could say selected where it was turned on. And so whenever it's clicked, we can evaluate the current value of is checked, either true, false, or null. Finally, we talked about the toggle switch, and that would allow us to define uh, some content for the on content and the off content. So when you flip on the switch, you can show this content, whatever's here. In this case, we just put a text box. Uh, when the user switches it off, then it would display the other section here underneath uh, toggle switch off content. Okay. All right. So that was a whirlwind uh, review, but let's continue on. Uh, we talked next about implementing a simple hamburger navigation menu, and I pointed you to Jerry Nixon's example for a more full-featured example, uh, and I demonstrated my example in the most simplest way possible by using a split view and a list box control. At any rate, one of the things that we needed to do was actually to grab off a, um, some icons in the Sego MDL5 assets font. And I showed you how to use the character map app to find the fonts that you want to use. And then you prefix and suffix whatever the value is you find with a ampersand pound lowercase x and then suffix it with a semicolon. All right, and then finally, and I'm not going to write out a lot of this, you can always find this code example. You can use list box and list box items for the navigation links inside of a split view. And that's what we did in that example. And that technique is going to come in handy in the very next video because you're challenged to create a more full featured um, navigation, uh, hamburger navigation style with uh, the search bar and all that stuff. And we'll start that in the next lesson. We'll see you there. Thanks.